people over a period of 60 years. Among the small anonymous gravestones covered with grass lie many of the lobotomy patients. Their final resting place marked only by a number. Lobotomy, an irreversible operation that followed them to the grave. A mysterious word that conjures up images of crude brain surgery. But exactly what is lobotomy? Why did it happen? To whom was it done? In the following procedure, the surgeon inserts the leukotome into the brain. Lobotomy was one of the most controversial surgical procedures in medical history. His first move is to penetrate directly through the brain from one opening in the skull to the other. This is historic footage from the National Library of Medicine of an actual lobotomy operation being performed in 1942. The surgeon then clamps a hemostat. Lobotomy was an attempt to control violent mental patients by inserting a probe into the brain and blindly moving it about, severing nerve connections in the frontal lobe of the brain, the main area that controls behavior, intelligence, and personality. It was done because, at the time, almost nothing else was available to treat severely disturbed and uncontrollable people who were a physical threat to themselves and others. Patients diagnosed as extreme paranoid schizophrenics. These are people who are out of touch with reality, who believe things that were patently false, who heard voices that uh, weren't there, making them feel badly about themselves. The clinical director of Pilgrim State is Dr. Miklos Losansi. On another extreme, they may get suddenly explosively angry and upset for no apparent reason or for a, a minor provocation. And these people are not able to function in society at large. Some 1,500 lobotomies were performed in the late 40s and 50s at Pilgrim State's Building 23, where Helen Savaris was the chief operating room nurse. I was about 18, 19 years old at the time, student nurse. I dreaded when I knew I had to come up here. Tom, this was our operating room. The patients would be lined in the hall. Uh, the prep had already been done. Their heads were shaven, ready for the lobotomies. And they were brought into this room. And roughly how long did it take to do a lobotomy? Uh, 45 minutes. The surgeon would be over here. The patient would be here. At the head of the table? At the head of the table. But the drill itself was a hand drill. A hand drill? A hand drill and the surgeon would drill. We would be handing the instruments, all right. Then they would use a probe, and they would go into the... Through the holes in the, the skull. Hole. That, exactly right. This was as routine as what a tonsillectomy? Ex exactly, exactly. In mental institutions, it was. Lobotomy was first done in 1935 by Igos Muniz, a Portuguese doctor. It was pioneered in this country by Dr. Walter Freeman, a Washington, D.C. neurologist who eventually performed over 4,000 procedures. In the late 40s and 50s, it's estimated some 50,000 lobotomies were done in the United States. Remember, there were no antipsychotic drugs at the time, and lobotomy was thought to be a miraculous cure. So much so that in 1949, Dr. Moniz was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on lobotomy. According to medical experts, it worked for some extreme cases, calming them. A few even returned to homes and families. But for thousands of other less severe cases, including mentally retarded patients and manic depressives, unnecessary lobotomies did irreparable damage. Because of the inexact science of the operation, it dulled their personalities, effectively dehumanizing some of them. Let's look at her positive symptoms first. The latest study on the long-term effects of lobotomy is now underway at Pilgrim State, under the supervision of clinical director, Dr. Miklos Lasansi. I believe it was a mistake that was driven by desperation. It uh, was something that uh, was done because these poor, suffering individuals uh, had no hope for life, and the doctors that treated them wanted to have a hope. What about the people who were part of this bizarre mistake? Let's take a look at how it affected three lives that were part of this shadowy period. A team of psychiatrists and researchers at Pilgrim State hope to discover more about how the frontal lobes of the brain work by examining the largest group of lobotomy patients in any mental hospital in the country, 100. The patient population is aging out, they're getting older, they're dying. And we don't have access to a group, such a large group, in one spot. And uh, basically, we'll never be able to study these people again without doing it now. 
How are you today? Oh, how are you? The discovery of antipsychotic drugs in the late 1950s ended the lobotomy era. My name is Cynthia. If doctors have been able to treat Pauline White with drugs, her life may have been significantly changed. She had a lobotomy in 1959 and is now part of the lobotomy study. Pauline, I'm going to be asking you some questions. Hospital okay. records say Pauline is 66. She says she's 56. She's paranoid schizophrenic with delusions and hallucinations. What do you call this? Pauline was admitted to Pilgrim State in 1953 after a series of violent incidents, including one with a neighbor, who Pauline said stole her boyfriend. How about this one? Today, 32 years after the operation, she appears calmer and, according to hospital officials, rarely gets into arguments. Do you have any children? Yeah. She still suffers from hallucinations and says she often hears the voice of God and thinks she's a former Miss America. And my son is in Europe. He's in Europe? Yeah, Johnny. Johnny. What, is, what does he do there? Well, they say he's the king of some parts of Europe. He's a king? He's a king, my son. That's a pretty important job. I had four children. My first daughter, she died. So Gail come along, my oldest daughter. Next two years, my son came. Next three years, my baby came, Teresa. So I had three married kids. According to hospital records, Pauline never had children. Recently, Pauline was discharged to a skilled nursing facility nearby to receive constant care. The first step back to being able to take care of herself. Adele Goodstein, 64, is a lobotomy patient who has made it all the way out of Pilgrim now and can almost take care of herself. She's progressed to a special nursing home where she receives medical supervision and drug treatment, but is free to move about the community on her own. Adele was a lively and pretty 20-year-old from Brooklyn when this picture was taken. She was married that same year, 1947, and moved to California with her new husband. According to her older brother, she returned home alone six months later. Okay, anything else? I'll be it. He said she had become another person. 25. She would flare up and become verbally abusive, although she was never physically violent. Okay, she was admitted to Pilgrim shortly thereafter, and in 1951, she had a lobotomy. Her father signed the consent papers. So your father approved it. The doctor got a signature. Did you have any say in it? None whatsoever. Answer this question. She developed speech problems after the operation. What do you remember about the operation itself? They sent me to the beauty parlor to have my hair shaved off. I said, put a towel around my head. I'm embarrassed. Apparently, Adele's behavioral problems are not as severe as before the operation. Like everyone else, she still dreams of a better life. I don't know why they did it to me, but they did. But I want a studio apartment in Greenwich Village. I want a job on 34th Street, and I want to get married. And I did something to my skull. I can Too see old. the scars still here. Yeah. That's where one went in? Yeah, they, they drilled the, the, the cuts with the bone. Mm -hmm. Took some of fall over my brain. Siegfried, I've got to take in for lunch. Siegfried Sonic today at 64 is polite and mild-mannered. He's been here since he was 14 years old. His sister Marie visits him regularly. She remembers. He was a perfectly normal child. And this happened very suddenly when something went wrong and he just snapped and became ill. I remember my mother having to make the decision and it was very difficult, but she had to do it because he was so violent. He was in a straitjacket six months out of the year and at that time they had nothing else. He was much calmer. Yeah, he, he didn't have to be restrained after that lobotomy. Medical records indicate a long history of schizophrenic violent behavior, often based on his obsessive and irrational fear of black people. Still today, he denies it's a problem. So you were a violent man before the lobotomy. You would fight? No, I wasn't violent, but those Negroes, you just look at them and they want, they want to pick a fight with you. They take advantage of a white person.
Ironically, it's a black hospital attendant Siegfried considers his closest friend. Eugene Townsend is his constant escort because Siegfried is so disturbed, he'll never leave the hospital. Lobotomy, the experts agree, was a desperate effort during a time when there was nothing else to offer. And nurse Helen Savaris was an eyewitness to this dark era in medical history. And you can see a life that was so disturbing, at least had life with them, and then see them afterwards. There was no feeling in the face, there was no expression in the face. The patient many times would be sitting on the floor, drooling, no conception of where he is. That's tragic. It was pathetic. Tom, I was thinking watching this, it's too bad that the hospital tranquilizers didn't come on the scene 20 years earlier. It, this may never have done. It is a shame, Hugh. That uh, would have eliminated the need for lobotomies. Right. And lobotomy, of course, was a desperate operation, a desperate procedure for a desperate problem at the time. And actually, it helped a number of people. The problem was it became sort of a cure-all and it was used too widely, and then uh, people who didn't need it were caught up in it. That's where the dark side comes. Why has it been so difficult to learn the re really the results of all this lobotomizing? Research is very difficult. Pilgrim State is, again, trying to do deep research into this, but they're running into problems because it's such a stigma, no one wants to admit they ever had the operation, those who are surviving, so they're having a difficult time finding, and they're looking for people who might help them. Thank you, Tom. Right. We'll have more.